participate to this week's Inverse Problem Seminar. So we happy to have François Monar with us. Um, and he will be talking about uh, various aspects of abelian and no abelian X-ray transforms. So, so thanks a lot uh, for joining us, François. Uh, I'm looking forward to your talk. All right, well, thank you very much, Katja and Knut, for uh, keeping the community alive for so long. And, um, and so um, I want to talk about um, all these things in the title, um, and I'll make sure I can define every, everything one at a time. Um, it's essentially kind of the recent results over the past um, two, three years on, on, um, on, on four or five papers, um, three of which are in collaborations with, uh, collaboration with Gabriel Paternan and, and Richard Nicol at, uh, at Cambridge, where um, we have a it's it's where the um, the statistical inversion um, side kind of drives the uh, classical inverse problem analysis, um, such you know making statements such as injectivity stability um, and also refined mapping properties for for X-ray transforms, um, um, essentially uncertainty quantification questions or or statistical inversion um, questions trying to make theoretical uh, statements about the reliability of such approaches um, um, it actually drives the uh, the classical analysis even further. <clears throat> so that's the story I'm trying to tell. Um, let me make sure I can click. Okay. Um, so the way I'm trying to articulate this talk is. Uh, um, talking about the first half hour is actually talking about the main, the main, the motivation, the main results, um, and uh, give some numerical illustration. And you know, in those times, uh, maybe half hour is just already good enough for for attention span. Uh, maybe some of them are less interested. Uh, some of you guys are less interested in the in the detail. And so, um, so I relegated the details to uh, the second half of the talk. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So to give a bit of, of introduction, I I'm going to introduce the um, um, geodesic X-ray transform. Um, typically, we define it, say, this is an example here where I'm going to take a, a domain in R2. Um, that's going to be my example of a, of a Riemann surface. And then I'm going to put a metric on it. And the metric induces a, uh, a geodesic. OK. And this is a, a geodesic flow, so I can I can shoot geodesic from the from the boundary from boundary point and an inward pointing vector, and um, and it propagates, um, let's say according to that that sound speed type metric right now, and I can integrate a function on on um, that that would be defined on this. Uh, uh, by the way, can you guys see the cursor when I move it? Yes. Okay. Good. Um, so, so you can have a function defined by three blobs here, and I can integrate it um, over all possible curves passing through um, um, the uh, the domain. And see, for example, and typically this gives rise to the this this right hand side, which is the on the right side the sinogram, um, where every uh, fan shot from the boundary point gives rise to a column of data. And so this column of data in red gives you the value of all, all the curve integrals of this function. And then if you change you know, the, 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 the position of the boundary point where, where to shut geodesics from, then you get a different column of data. And the point is to try to recover the, the left side from the, from the right side. And in particular, um, you know, hit it with the whole inverse problem agenda, I mean, injectivity, stability, et cetera, et cetera. In particular, trying to understand how the answer to these questions um, depends on the choice of metric on the domain. And, um, and so if you don't put any metric on it, um, namely you put the Euclidean metric, uh, this is actually the, the setting of the, the radon transform and, and X-ray um, computerized tomography where, where geodesics are straight line. Straight line. Um, so that's, that's uh, used every day in medical imaging. And, and then, um, one of, two of the motivations for, for throwing a metric at this problem um, are when you start considering propagation of photon in, in media with variable index of refraction, 
or um, linearizing the, the trouble time tomography problem where, where uh, seismic wave fronts propagate along geodesics of a, of a certain metric, which gives you information about the, the inner core um, structure of the Earth. Um, so this is what I would consider, what I would call um, the ability in the X-ray transform, because the um, integrand is scalar. Now, um, um, let me explain what I would mean by a non-abelian uh, version of that story. And so what I would, what I need to introduce is, is um, I still have this, uh, this, this surface here, there's a Riemann surface, but I'm going to put a bundle on it. Um, so it's, it's essentially you think of a vector space sitting above every point, and then ask yourself, how can you propagate objects in, in this vector space as, as a point varies on the base? And so in order to, to lift a curve from the base manifold to the bundle, you need um, a connection. And then you can also throw a, a Higgs field, um, so which are like a, a, a skew Hermitian valued field on the, on the, on the base, uh, whereas the connection is, a, is a, a matrix of one forms. And what that allows you to do, starting from a, from a geodesic on the base, you can propagate objects um, upstairs according to the following dynamics along each curve, okay? And um, in this case, I don't care about the connection. Actually, I'm going to take the trivial connection. And um, what, I can, what I can do is from any ingoing point and ingoing direction, I can take a state in this, in this um, here, and I can, I can parallel translate it um, up until the other end of the geodesic. And that gives me a linear operator um, which contains information about, about um, this Higgs field phi, which is the thing I'm trying to recover. And, um, and in other words, what you're, what you're really, the information you have when, you, when you're going from ingoing state to outgoing state is um, the fundamental matrix solution of a system of ODEs along each geodesic. And because this matrix is, um, you know, is a matrix, then um, um, you know, it's a system of ODE and, and, and it's a, you can think of it as a whose solution is no longer explicit. And um, you know, it's something you also call uh, non-abelian integration, for instance. Um, it, un, you know, unless phi commutes with its um, flow derivative, then um, this is a, a non-abelian process. And, um, and the inverse problem then is to um, recover the pair, although I'm telling you that the connection is zero here, is to recover these, um, this, um, this Higgs field phi from the scattering data, which is the inward to um, outward map, uh, mapping any state um, over any geodesic. Okay. And um, if, if phi is a, is, a, is a scalar, then um, it's also so-called the attenuated X-ray transform, uh, which shows up in SPECT. Um, and um, and if, I, if I were to reduce this to the, to the scalar case, then, then there would be about um, 150 other uh, authors in the bottom of this slide. So let's not um, spend too much time on that. Um, now, this problem has a, a very interesting application, which is um, uh, polarimetric neutron tomography, whose whose idea is to is to probe um, is to probe materials with with the uh, neutrons, and um, and use information about how their spin processes as they pass through the medium in order to reconstruct the magnetic field inside the medium. Um, so so you can throw a proton at a at a magnetic material. Uh, of course, the magnetic field so the proton has no charge, so the magnetic field First approximation doesn't change the the trajectory, um, the spatial trajectory of the of the protons, but on the other hand, their spin does evolve according to this precession law here. Um, so if t is a parameter along any of the of the of the curve you might you might fix, then uh, the the spin is according to this. The, the spin is evolving according to this equation here, and um, and that corresponds to. To, to thinking of, of the magnetic field as, as being a, a little SO3 valued Higgs field, okay? And so here, this is a, an example of what the experimental setup looks like. Um, you, can, you can actually polarize 
um, the spin of the protons before you throw it, throw it at a sample, and then um, and then analyze as they pass through. In the end, you can analyze um, scalar components of the of the outgoing spin using polarizers again, and um, and you can re in doing so um, you you can reconstruct the um, the scattering data of the magnetic field. Um, if you do this for every single component of of, um, of the spin in to spin out uh, amount. And so if you have that data and you know how to in invert the non-abelian X-ray transform, then you can image um, uh, magnetic field inside materials. So <clears throat> um, since this is a practical setup, then there's going to be some noise to it. So this is, by the way, this is the problem I want to consider here. Um, and um, and since this is a, a practical setup, we we also want to to consider um, noise in the in the data, and um, and our noise model will be um, you guessed it Gaussian, um, <clears throat> and and so the idea is to is to recover. So despite the fact that okay, so so the the, the polarimetric neutron tomography uses S, S, little SO three valued um, Higgs field, but but the results I'm going to talk about really apply to any um, skewer emission Higgs field over bundles of any rank. Okay, so we don't really have to worry about SO3 specifically. And um, and the idea is to is to cast a, a, um, a certain number of geodesics at random. So n will be our our parameter. And um, and um, to cast a certain number of geodesic at random and then compute the um, scattering data and add a, 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 an instance of, of Gaussian noise to it. Um, well, actually this is an equality uh, between matrices and I'm gonna uh, do this for um, every single matrix component, yeah? And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna, so at that point my data is noisy and I cannot recover the truth uh, with certainty. Yeah, and so what I do is um, <clears throat> is I'm going to do um, a Bayes I'm going to adopt the Bayesian approach. I'm going to choose a prior model for for what my Higgs field should be. Something like okay, let's let's assume phi should be uh, uh, a subordinate uh, a sub field of of some of certain class, and then um, and then if I, and, and that induces a um, a prior model for phi, and together with the noise model that I chose, the Gaussian the Gaussian noise model that I chose, I can use Bayes formula to to get the the probability density of what I think of the posterior random variable phi, knowing the data set um, data set being defined by d sub n, the geodes the family of geodesics together with the data the, together with the noisy data, and um, and so. A statistical, a statistical approach to inverse problem no longer attempts to recover the truth, which it can be with, cannot do with certainty. On the other hand, what it's going to do is going to explore the posterior density <clears throat> and perhaps extract important features that might tell you where the truth lies with a certain confidence. Um, so, so the posterior, the log posterior distribution, um, by the way, looks like this. So, let's say. Um, uh, something coming from from what you call the likelihood term, which is a L two L two norm of the data <coughs> minus the uh, of y minus the data, plus a, a penalization term. So this is not that far either from a, a Chikunov uh, regularized um, functional. And um, um, I want just to tell you that if if the map the forward map uh, um, phi map to C phi was linear, then this thing should be quadratic, and then the posterior would be Gaussian, and then you pretty much know everything about the posterior um, uh, law. You know, you know its mean, and you you know its uh, its covariance. <clears throat> but here, uh, because this map is nonlinear, this is this is by no means a, a, a Gaussian posterior distribution. Um, although one of the points that I'm going to make later is that um, things will look asymptotically. Um, um, normal as uh, the number of measurement points goes to to, to infinity. <clears throat> and so when you have a, a problem like this, what do you do? 
So, okay, so also the unknown using uh, infinite dimensional space, let's just simplify the problem and say, okay, let me fix one of the, let me fix a test field, okay. It's just, uh, it's, and I'm gonna take the moment against that test field. So now that becomes a, a one dimensional random variable um, and I'm trying to approximate the truth. In that case, the truth would be the true field um, paired with my test field, okay. And I'm interested in looking at the posterior um, random variable um, phi paired with this test field, knowing the data. And the questions are as follows. Um, so, so I know, you know, I know, I know, I have an expression for the posterior distribution of that random variable. And I want to ask myself, what kind of relevant estimators for the truth can I extract from this posterior distribution? Um, and oftentimes you're looking at uh, the mean of that. So the mean will in involve computing an integral, uh, typically solving Markov chain and approximating by, by taking the average over that chain. Um, um, other, and, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, or you could look at the maximum a posteriori, so the arg max of, of the, the posterior distribution. <clears throat> Although, and, and that typically leads to optimization problem. I'm not gonna talk about that. Um, can you, uh, the next question is, can you actually compute these um, in, a, in, a, in a feasible way? And, um, and so outside the computational um, setting, questions three and four are more about the, the statistical guarantees of, of, um, of such constructions, right? Um, can I prove that these estimators that I that I constructed earlier converges to the truth as the number of measurement points goes to infinity in any sense? And then what's more is that um, um, can I guarantee that actually the whole posterior distribution um, concentrates all its mass around that that estimator um, as the number of measurable points goes to infinity? And, um, and that would mean that, you know, not, not only, um, I mean, it, it, it would give you um, confidence set in terms of like how far can you, could you, might you be from the truth um, if you're not exactly there, yeah? <clears throat> so, um, so that's kind of the setting that I was trying to, to describe here. What, what are the typical questions and approaches? Um, um, let me see how I'm doing on time, 20, okay. Um, I'll describe the main results. And first of all, I want to, to give the main messages of, of this talk, if, if anything. So, so the first one is that ma making UQ statements for inverse problems um, requires a refined understanding of mapping properties of the forward operator or the normal operator or their uh, its linearized version. So when, when you're in the, uh, um, a nonlinear setting, uh, you will end up having looking at um, the linearized operator, which we already do in, the, in, the, in, in inverse problems anyway, if you can prove the linearized operator is uh, injective or stable, then, then you can make statement about the nonlinear operator in, in certain cases. Um, and, but, but, um, but, you know, if any, if anything, the statement means that, you know, if you, if you're losing faith in, in, in um, theoretical analysis of inverse problem, because, you know, you're producing um, non, non-constructive injectivity proof or stability proof, well, be assured that it actually helps um, the statistical aspects of it. And in fact, you don't need a reconstruction. You know, stat the statistical method actually gives you approaches to get uh, reconstructions, even if you don't have uh, reconstruction formulas, which we'll, which we'll see in a, in a minute. <clears throat> um, now, um, focusing on the X-ray X-ray type problems on, on manifold with boundary, um, the, obtaining these mapping properties. Um, been typically formulated in, in some Sobolev scales or, um, or, or, or smooth uh, spaces of smooth functions. So, so that's what I mean by uh, Frechet, Frechet intersections or something. Um, now what we'll see in a little bit is that the, 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 the Sobolev scales is non-standard here um, in order to accurately, capture, um, to accurately capture the mapping properties of X-ray transforms. 
and in particular they they, they might depend on um, which topologies you're choosing um, which weight you're putting on the l2 l2 setting of x-ray transports and um, and so 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 I'll discuss those weights a little bit but um, let me say that the, the this choice of weight can come from two things it could come from theoretical tractability we'll see we'll see um, that some weights are nicer than others um, although you know the most natural one might not be the best one for theoretical purposes. Um, <clears throat> and so that'd be the, the theoretical motivation for it. Uh, but also it could come from your noise model at the level of, um, uh, you know, in your data space, are you, you know, are, are for example, are short geodesics um, more important than, uh, or, or, or more frequent? That's also a question that you could ask in, in a practical setting. And that might give you a, uh, a different weight um, to be considered in the in the L2 L2 boundedness setting of the X-ray transport. <clears throat> Although, let me just say, okay, if you only care about integrands that are compactly, strictly compactly supporting inside the domain, then then all this analysis is kind of um, it's interesting, but it's less um, impactful somehow. Okay, so, so let me give, uh, get to the main results. So I have three results I want to discuss. Um, the first one is to look at just the X-ray transform on the, on the disk, uh, on the Euclidean disk. And, um, and uh, the result is that I can, uh, we, we can prove an isomorphism property of, of C infinity um, into itself, onto itself, um, for functions that are smooth all the way up to the boundary included. Okay. Um, and um, and if you, up, upon defining a, a special scale of Hilbert spaces, um, we, you can also get um, isometric properties between between HS, tw what I call HS twiddle and HS plus one twiddle. Um, so, so isometric meaning, you know, bounded, um, stable, you know, and, and sh with sharp constants, um, essentially. And this space, um, this this scale is actually defined as a domain type spaces for for um, for real powers of um, of a, a distinguished second order differential operator on the disk, which um, in polar coordinates rho omega um, looks like this. So it's elliptic at interior points, and uh, this one minus rho square here it tells you that it actually degenerates normally, its ellipticity degenerates normally at the, um, at the boundary in a certain way. And, um, and so, and so it, this is where you can imagine that, uh, that the Sobolev scale um, you, you define is, is non-standard. Non um, since you know, the standard one is based on the Laplacian, which does not degenerate at the boundary in that way. Okay, and, um, and so, so a couple of comments about this result um, is that um, the the L2 topology um, is not the usual what people think of the usual one, uh, the one coming from Santalo's formula or from the fact that uh, uh, um, the scattering relation preserves a symplectic measure. But you actually have to div divide by before applying the the traditional adjoint, you would have to divide by by um, by the cosine of the angle with the normal. Um, <clears throat> and then a second comment is that uh, um, you can also prove this for um, um, constant curvature disks. Um, and so I'll, I'll briefly mention that later also. Okay, so that's the, the first result. Um, and again, this mapping property is is very very much driven by this the, the, the interaction we have with Richard Nichol, who, who who wants who needs such isomorphism property to prove um, theorems on the uh, on the um, statistical inversion. <clears throat> so so um, so the second result I want to mention is that um, um, this. You might, you might ask yourself, well, how, how much these, um, these mapping properties persist, right? There, there's some non-trivial behavior at the boundary here. And, um, and, and in fact, that, that behavior is highly sensitive to, to what metric you're looking at and then what boundary you're looking at. Um, um, it's not even clear that a, a 
general Euclidean domain has the same story actually. And, um, but on the other hand, you can kind of cook up a, a Fred Holmes setting and some kind of, you know, you can ask yourself, well, what's a relatively compact perturbation of this setting? And, um, and a relatively compact perturbation of this setting is to look at um, an attenuated X-ray transform with attenuation matrix um, to, be, to be compactly supported. And if, if the attenuation matrix is compactly supported, then um, you can prove the, the exact same isomorphism properties uh, for the corresponding normal operator um, um, on the Euclidean disk again, or any other, um, any other simple surface that could be used as a, a reference case. So from the previous theorem, um, actually this also holds for another class of surfaces and, and, and you could also, you know, go from theorem one from to theorem two uh, using using a perturbation setting. Okay, and um, <clears throat> and so how does that help here? Because so the X-ray transform, I, the attenuated X-ray transform is a is not quite the non-abelian X-ray transform. It's a linear map, um, um, which the non-abelian X-ray transform is not. On the other hand, it's the it's related to the linearization of the non-abelian X-ray transform, and so um, you can so the the, the main the main um, important um, consequence of the previous theorem is um, for the inversion, the statistical inversion of the non-abelian X-ray transform, in the sense that if you go back to the problem I I described before, so so try to reconstruct the Higgs field from from noisy non-abelian x-ray data um, to some, some prior among a flexible class, which I'm, you know, I'm gonna omit the details of this. Um, um, then, then the kind of theorem you can cook up is the following. So, so you have this, um, the Bayesian setting produces a, a posterior distribution. Um, we've proved in a previous article that um, this posterior distribution does have a mean and you can, and not only that it, that it exists, but also it converges in some sense to the truth as the number of measure points, measurement points con, uh, um, converge to infinity. And the next question you might ask is, well, how, how much does the posterior distribution um, contract around, around this, uh, this estimator in order to get um, confidence margin? And, um, and the new theorem is the following. So, so um, that as the number of, uh, measurement points goes to infinity, you can take the, the posterior random variable, remove this, the, the posterior mean and, and pair it with the, the test function, the condition on the data, and you rescale it by, by square root of the number of measurement points. And that converges in law to um, a normal random variable um, with a certain uh, width. Uh, with a certain um, covariance, covariance. And, um, and what we see here is that in, in all, so this is an example of what people call Bernstein von Mises theorems on, on um, asymptotic posterior normality. And so, you know, morally speaking, what you want to say out of this is that if I call sigma square um, this number in red, right, then, then the, the, the posterior random variable asymptotically is centered, is, is, a, is, a, is a Gaussian random variable centered at the, at, the, um, at the posterior mean with variance sigma over root n, yeah? And so this is, this is kind of, you know, I can draw a Gaussian and know with what, prop, with what confidence things, um, things might be uh, located, yeah? And what we see is that in, in all these theorems, then, um, the whole point to, in order to produce uncertainty quantification statements, what we find out is that the whole point is to actually um, be able to guarantee that, um, that the normal operator, some normal operator is well-defined and invertible. And this is where the mapping properties are, are so crucial. So we want to find a setting where this number is actually finite. And, um, and so, um, I theta naught here is a is an attenuated X-ray transform where the theta naught, so the attenuation matrix is, um, it's an attenuated X-ray transform defined on Higgs fields. 
um, and and the um, and the attenuation itself is is built out of the the true um, I mean the the point at which you you're linearizing the map um, phi maps to C phi. Yeah, and um, and so what we see is that um, and, and this is actually a, a general machinery that that, that Richard Nico has developed is that um, this is actually kind of true for for a, a broad class of 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 of, um, of inverse problems um, uh, given a, a certain conditions on the choice of prior and then given certain properties on the on the theoretical side of the inverse problem in terms of you know injectivity stability mapping properties and so the whole point of this is actually to to show that um, um, uh, we have good you know we can make sense of this inverse in, in some good sense and and um, and on simple manifold you can you can you can think um, you can always claim that this is a, an elliptic side EO, but then inverting it all the way up to the boundary can be challenging and this was this was part of the um, challenges encountered here <clears throat> how am I doing on time okay so um, so that's kind of uh, the narrative I, I, I wanted to, to, to present. And um, I can give you a, a numerical illustration of, of, um, of all these, uh, of these claims or, or perhaps for the statistical inversion purposes. Um, so you could take um, a computational domain, let's take the unit disk um, and then um, Euclidean metric. And I'm gonna take uh, uh, SO3 um, magnetic field what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute um, uh, scattering data. So the non-abelian non X-ray transform this magnetic field. I'm going to add noise to it. Um, mind you, there's no reconstruction formula for this. And, um, and I'm, going to, I'm going to construct a, a sample of, of the posterior um, distribution and, and extract information out of it. That's the main idea. Um, and instead of SO3, I'm going to throw it into little SU2 instead because everything is two by two instead of three by three, although com complex values, but for computation purposes, that's, that's what I ended up doing. Um, um, so, so, so it's a two by two, um, a skew Hermitian matrix. If you, if A, B, C are the three functions here, I throw them in there, I make a, 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 a SU2 valued, little SU2 valued um, field. And, um, and the data might look like this. So the noiseless data, um, so, so you can think of this as a, also a field of two by two complex valued matrix, big SU2 valued. And this is the real part on the left, the imaginary part on the right. And, and what this really looks like is kind of like some, some coupled version of three X-ray transforms of, of each of the scalar components here. Um, except that they're coupled in non-abelian way, but if you've seen sinograms before, that this this might not be all that surprising to you what the, what these things look like, and um, and so that would be uh, on a fine enough grid. But then the the real life might just be like more like a, a random sample that looks like this, and um, and then I'm going to throw a noise to it, and then now that's what that's what it looks like, um, and so this is the data I'm dealing with, and then next. Um, what I said is I need the noise model and the prior, and the prior <coughs> is typically defined in terms of a, a covariance matrix on the mesh, because unknown functions are just characterized by their values on the, at each uh, vertex, and uh, using a, a good a covariance matrix associated with certain um, Gaussian processes, here is called a matern, matern widow um, Gaussian process, um, I can, ex you know, I can generate samples of, of trial functions which are in some Sobolev class. So these are examples of, of that. And then the parameters here talk about, you know, typical length of variations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and out of that, I want to explore um, the posterior distribution, which is given to me as a, uh, through, through Bayesian's uh, formula. And, um, and the way I'm going to use, uh, the way I'm going to explore the posterior distribution is using Monte Carlo, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo, and in particular, this precondition cranking Coulson algorithm, um, which essentially consists of, of drawing um, new, at every step, drawing new um, 
draws from the prior and then cooking up this increment and then staring at the log likelihood and looking at whether it, it increases or decreases. And um, if, it, um, if the log likelihood increases, then I'm definitely accepting the new candidate for, for the next term in the chain. And if it doesn't, then, then maybe I still accept it with some probability. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and then once I, once I run this for a certain amount of time uh, of iteration, then I get a chain of, of, posterior, um, of, of posterior draws and I can, I can do something with them. Like for example, you know, taking the average might give me an estimate of, of what, the, what the posterior mean should be. And then if I start looking at a moment against the test field of each of those draws and drawing histograms, then I might get information about the you know, one dimensional um, posterior objects, posterior features, um, and in particular this, their statistics. So, <clears throat> um, so in order to do that, I have to make sure that the, 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 the posterior um, draws of that chain are uh, become become independent and that they actually and, and that this algorithm actually draws from the posterior because it's not it's not immediate at first but um, but people have taken care of these things um, and um, and so so here's an example so so let me take 400 data points um, and then these are the parameters of the chain um, sigma is noise model here and then delta is the step size uh, with which I'm probing the 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 Markov I'm using the, um, with which I'm um, it's the cranking constant parameter here the two delta sitting here okay um, and um, and if I so that that gives me um, say a hundred thousand draws from the posterior um, distribution and out of this I can take the sample average and I where what I'm going to get is something that that um, that's not too far from the truth, although kind of, although kind of hinting at me that I'm, I don't have enough data points, but if I increase the number of data points, then um, I'm gonna get a better uh, reconstruction. Um, and all you're doing is essentially computing forward data every single time and accepting them according to some um, statistical criterion. And that actually gives you a way of, of um, reconstructing something with a reasonable um, reasonable appearance. <clears throat> so, um, so, so that that was that's an illustration of, of this consistency theorem, which was um, appeared in a, a paper um, um, earlier. Now, um, to talk about the uh, that doesn't talk about qu uncertainty quantification at all, right? That doesn't tell you where where the the whole posterior distribution is um, is relative to to its mean. And, um, and the way you would visualize that is, is more as follows. So, so you could draw um, a ton of iteration, so a million, and, um, and you have three fields that say, these are my test fields. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna take my chain and I'm gonna, I'm gonna take moments with each of these. And I'm just gonna draw, um, so each of, of these things is, a, is, a, is just a scalar random variable and I'm gonna explore the statistics of those. And for each, the red dot is actually the true, um, the true uh, value, and then the green and the, the green dot is the posterior mean of that of that one-dimensional random variable, and then I get the the the, the, the variance um, in, in black on either side of the mean. Um, and um, you can choose to to call these things uh, Gaussian looking or not. Um, but this is what you can access. This is what you obtain um, as a, uh, using MCMC as a tool in order to explore posterior distributions. Um, so that is the first part of my talk about the the, the kind of like the, the main narrative and the and the illustration. Um, if there's any question at this point, if there isn't, I can just um, talk about um, a little bit more about the proofs now. <clears throat> Okay, and I have until 55 or, or the hour. Yeah, that hour is 
Okay, that's good. Power? Okay, good. All right. So, um, let it go. Um, so, so the first theorem was, uh, if you remember, I want, uh, it was about uh, the uh, the mapping properties of the unattenuated Dirichlet transform on the on the Euclidean disk, and um, and so I want to talk a bit about that first. Um, so, so what was known before? Let me just say. Um, what was known before is on simple surfaces. So simple is just things that don't have conjugate points or ugly topology um, and, and a strict, strictly convex boundary. Then um, <clears throat> one could prove injectivity of the X-ray transform um, that's imposed of order one half in the sense that you can, you can derive the following stability estimate. <clears throat> but the other norm of F is, is controlled by the, the H1 norm of the normal operator. Where the normal operator is this adjoint with respect to a certain choice of topology, um, the one that I'm trying to avoid using. The main issue with the stability estimate was that it, it depends on an extension of the of the manifold because you you want to um, turn M into essentially sitting inside an open set of, of a slightly bigger thing where you can do math on it, uh, well-behaved math on it, and. Um, <clears throat> And so the question is, can you obtain uh, mapping properties that don't require such an extension? And um, and that was a you know that question was actually driven by by our first project with uh, Richard Nicole and, and Gabriel Paterman. And um, and and so in this case, um, so this is the, in this first case, actually the this the normal operator looks like this. So in the traditional uh, functional setting, it's essentially integrating f against the exponential map um, at the point x, and um, and and that what that means is that that operator um, <clears throat> actually naturally wants to extend to an extension of m. So if if you take m twiddle a simple extension of m, then that operator is nothing but the restriction of a natural operator defined in a slightly bigger thing. And that, that, that operator defined on a slightly bigger thing is a side EO at interior points. And, and M consists of a bunch of interior points of M twiddle. And, and moreover, you can stare at its principal symbol or even its full symbol across the boundary of M and, and uh, claim it satisfies this minus one half transmission condition. And then you can use calculus from Boutet Movelle and, 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 and refined by Hermander to show to, to, to show that, um, th that you can obtain isomorphism properties in the following setting. Um, and um, so I star I here will map D to the minus one half infinity into C infinity and, and um, isomorphically so. <clears throat> and, and what that means is um, what, what that means is that um, um, it's not quite C infinity um, isomorphism. Um, D, by the way, is a boundary defining function. So, so te te technically, you, you have to add functions that use functions that blow up a little bit near the boundary here. And you have a counterpart in, in Hilbert scales where you have the traditional Hilbert scale on the right side, but on the domain side, um, you need to introduce these, these mu transmission spaces. So, these minus one half transmission spaces. Um, so, these are ad hoc scales of spaces introduced by Hermander. And um, they're not really easy to work with, especially um, you know if, if, if you if you work in inverse problems, you know that some inversion algorithm for anything kind of consists of of iterating the normal operator. And if I'm trying to iterate this normal operator on this space, I actually don't even know what it does because I don't have the same scale of space on the left and on the right. So so that's one of the caveats of of, of this result is. It's nice and sharp, but it doesn't um, quite, um, it, it, it's not quite satisfactory in that sense. And, um, and, um, and yeah, so, so far the, the Hermander transmission space um, are not uh, great to work with, and then I could not iterate if I, even if I wanted to. Um, and so the next question, so the, the question of the first theorem addresses um, how to obtain a C-infinity, C-infinity isomorphism. And um, what kind of Sobolev scale would come with that? And um, and the way you would do that is by actually changing the weight on the codomain, um, because 
the, the symplectic weight that's traditionally used um, would allow would allow the functions in the range of the x-ray transform to blow up near tangential rays, which actually they don't. And so you can you can actually change the weight a little bit in such a way that the x-ray transform is still bounded. And in fact, in that case, it is the functional setting where the singular value decomposition is known in the Euclidean bit. Um, and, and so that, that's kind of hinting at us that this might um, give us some information um, about how to approach this. <clears throat> and so let me, let me spend some time on this. Um, um, what's this singular value decomposition that's actually been known for a long time? These are called the uh, Zernicke polynomials. Um, it's a two index uh, family. Um, the, the ones on the left side might be uh, the, the holomorphic functions and anti-holomorphic functions on the right side. And if you, if you fix a, a row, then they satisfy systems of Cauchy-Riemann equations going from the left to the right. Um, or also one way to construct this family is to start from one z, z square, et cetera, et cetera, and repeatedly, repeatedly apply the burning transform or a burning transform to actually generate the entire family. Um, um, so that version of, of this definition is, is in Kazan, Steph, and, and Book game. Um, and, um, and so it's a family of orthogonal polynomials. It's a, it's a L2 um, orthogonal polyno family of polynomials on the unit disk, um, um, also related to the um, Legendre polynomial, I believe. I'm probably um, on top of my head, I don't remember now. Um, and, um, and the x-ray transform of each of these functions, okay, forms the, the following family of functions on, in fan beam coordinates, and they're also orthogonal, um, telling you that you know the entire SD. So, um, and they're, they're orthogonal, not for the L2 mu topology, right? The, not, not the one that people usually use on, 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 uh, on Riemannian surface. And so that's, that's the main point here. Now, <clears throat> I guess the, the thing that per, that's perhaps less known is the relation between, um, between the X-ray transform and, and this operator I introduced earlier. So this differential operator um, that degenerates at the boundary um, also has the Zernicke polynomials as eigenfunctions. And what's more is that you can, you can find that the, the X-ray transform intertwines this operator with uh, uh, the square of a vector field in data space, and so does its adjoint, so that I star I um, commutes with this differential operator. And then just staring at the spectrum, what you find is that, um, is that in fact, I star I is a negative square root of this differential operator. You want to contrast that with the with the non-compact case of the Euclidean case, where the 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 arch, arch the radon transform transpose times composed with itself is a negative square root of the Euclidean Laplacian. And here it's 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 a, it's a, it's a result that genuinely takes into account you know the boundary information and that holds all the way up to the boundary included, and it it, it actually uses a, an operator that that's not quite um, the Laplacian anymore. <coughs> Well, what it also says is that uh, as far as describing smoothness and, and, and mapping properties of I star I, well, you definitely want to use that, that differential operator as, as a model operator. And then, and then once, you, once you have that in mind, then you can get the Hilbert scale out of this immediately. You can define that as domain of definition of, of powers of this operator. Um, and then you can get the isometric properties and then you, there's one thing you have to show is that the intersection of these spaces is actually C infinity, um, which, which is uh, not too much work. Um, and then um, find out that the, this, this normal operator is indeed a, a C infinity isomorphism. Now, how different is it from the earlier functional setting? It's essentially the same operator as the earlier functional setting, except that you're dividing one by one over cosine alpha in between I and, and the traditional adjoint, um, one over cosine alpha, where uh, alpha is the angle between the inward pointing vector and the normal vector. 
So, so how non-traditional this case is? Well, the, the H1 Twiddle space is a, a bigger than H1, for example, um, because functions in H1 Twiddle are allowed to oscillate a little faster um, 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 as one approaches the boundary normally. Um, and then it's still open to me whether these, these two scales of spaces are actually tamely equivalent. Um, <clears throat> Um, so you can actually, I'm not going to go into the details, but you, from, from this intertwining property, you can also realize that um, the X-ray transform will translate smoothness with respect to L into smoothness with respect to this operator minus T square. And so that motivates uh, defining non-standard Sobolev space is also in the data space. Um, in order to, to, to describe sharp mapping properties of the X-ray transform. Um, and so, but that's just for another day. <clears throat> another thing that's for another day is the fact that these results also work for um, a certain family of, of uh, simple surfaces, namely um, um, take any space of, uh, of constant curvature and then take a geodesic ball of fixed radius which as long as it's simple, um, the whole theory follows through. You can show that you can put a, a good topology on the data space, which makes the I zero star I zero infinity isomorphism. You can find distinguished op differential operator um, such that um, um, the, the normal operator is a negative square root of a distinguished um, degenerate elliptic second order differential operator. And then you can, you can obtain sharp range descriptions um, and, 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 and have a, a Sobolev scale that really embodies the fact that um, I zero is a, is a smoothing operator of, op of order one half. Um, and then that makes uh, you know, precise sense of these statements. And, um, and to me, that's an extremely interesting question um, as to how, how far you know, we can take these statements. I mean, it's not trivial fact that we can, we can invert uh, an elliptic operator exactly um, all the way up to the boundary included. And, um, and White might ask, you know, how, how far beyond um, the constant curvature case can we, can we, could we do that? Or, or even in constant curvature spaces, um, can we get um, domains with non-circular um, boundary symmetry? Or things with no circular symmetry. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so that was some, some, some bits about the first theorem, about the, the mapping properties. And then, um, well, I don't know how much time left I have, but let's see. Um, the second theorem was about the mapping properties of the attenuated X-ray transform. And regarding the attenuated tra X-ray transform, um, so the point I, I, I would like to make here is, is to, how do you set up, um, uh, forward and, and inverse mapping properties for such operators. So, so the, um, to define the attenuated X-ray transform, I need an attenuation matrix theta. And, um, and essentially I need to solve transport equations on the circle bundle um, for, for CN valued objects, okay? <clears throat> and um, and, and this, is, this is how I would define um, uh, the, the attenuated X-ray transform of F as the outcome of solving a transport equation with zero outgoing boundary condition and solving along each geodesic uh, a system of ODs in, in that way where, where, where F is a source term. And so this is, this is a form of X-ray transform with weight, if you will. And, um, and, the, and the claim is that, um, and so this is, uh, has had a um, 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 re uh, interest up until uh, pretty recently. <clears throat> the injectivity was settled in 2012 for simple Riemannian surfaces. And then uh, we obtained a stability estimate um, using Christoff identities um, recently. And, um, and the new result in that direction is that, uh, are the following, um, that you can also map C infinity into C infinity. That's actually already a, a non-trivial fact. Um, and also that these, this statement actually holds under um, a non-simplicity assumption. All you need is convex boundary and just be non-trapping. 
<clears throat> so you could have conjugate points and and, and um, still show that that this is true and and of course in the interior that's that's kind of obvious but but all the way up to the boundary is what's less obvious here um, and um, and to obtain the converse mapping properties um, meaning okay can you know is the in, is the inverse can the inverse be defined from c infinity to c infinity um, then we need to go back to the Euclidean disk um, and assume that the um, attenuation matrix is actually compactly supported and in that case then um, then you can obtain the same isomorphic properties as the um, as the unattenuated x-ray transform in the Euclidean um, disk so <clears throat> so I think um, let's see um, right so I will just use um, the last three minutes um, talking about elements of the proof of the second theorem. <clears throat> and, um, and the point is, is to is to um, is to understand how to exploit this new um, Hibbert scale, um, and to and to just revive uh, Fred Holm mapping, uh, Fred Holm properties on it. Yeah. Um, so so this is another pictorial uh, representation of the attenuated X-ray transform. I have a, a a vector valued function leaving above a, a surface, and then the X-ray the attenuated X-ray X-ray transform integrates f along that along that. Um, the, the trajectories upstairs, okay, <clears throat> and, um, and and so the question is to to try to understand what happens all the way up to the boundary, including in terms of mapping properties. You want to uh, ask yourself about the singularities of the Schwarz kernel of the normal operator, and and typically, well, in the interior, if there's no conjugate points, you have singularities at the at the at the diagonal, so the Schwarz kernel lives on the product manifold M cross M, and M cross M has um, has corners. Um, it's a manifold with boundary, and it, it's actually a manifold with corners. Um, there's 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 two um, one codimensional boundary components, hit and 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 um, hitting a corner uh, to the two dimension two codimensional boundary component DM cross DM. And the singular structure of the Schwarz kernel is conormal to the <coughs> to the diagonal, and and but also when you look at at non-open, I mean things with boundary, then then the whole question is what's the singular structure as the as the diagonal of the product manifold hits the corner, <coughs> and um, and there if you were really trying to understand how to invert that that operator or build a pair matrix for it, then then you re really need to understand um, the, the singular larity type um, there. And so, for instance, you might need to, to start doing uh, geometric microcode analysis and, and start blowing things up and, and, and fight to, in order to find in what um, um, a class of, of polyhomogeneous distributions um, the Schwarz kernel lives. Uh, but here, we can, we can kind of bypass this um, by by realizing that <clears throat> if the attenuation is compactly supported, and I take two points outside the support, and typically the Schwarz kernel is the is the unattenuated Schwarz kernel with some attenuation uh, factor in between the two points. And so, if the attenuation is only supported strictly inside, then then um, then the Schwarz kernel of the attenuated X-ray transform and the Schwarz kernel of the unattenuated X-ray transform agree um, near the corner here, which means that essentially the only part of the of the singular support that I, I want to invert for um, um, is essentially the um, only using um, you know microcode analysis in the interior or something. And so this is the whole point here is that. Um, is that the normal attenuated operator is nothing but the, the normal unattenuated operator plus a perturbation, which is so so in the interior morally these things are um, um, elliptic of order 
um, minus one, and then the perturbation is elliptic of or, uh, is not elliptic, it's just an order minus two um, in the interior, but also vanishing near the corner. And um, and so so to 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 find that this operator is actually Fredholm, then um, then you just have to show that this is a, a relatively compact perturbation of this first term, and um, and and somehow. Um, what it amounts to showing is that, you know, in the in, in the interior you would have mapping properties of, of the form HM into HM plus two, and you want to translate them into the this non-standard um, Sobolev scale, um, and um, and although these two scales with boundary behavior included might not be tamely equivalent, um, if you just restrict the non-standard scale to the interior, it might not come as a surprise that it's equivalent that that. HM twiddle topology is equivalent to the HM topology, and therefore you can find that um, you can find that this is a, a, a relatively compact perturbation on the non-standard um, Sobolev scale, um, and then assuming that the Sobolev scale satisfies you know compact embeddings, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which it does, and so that shows you that this operator is spread home, and then um, you can show that it's injective, so it's got trivial kernel. Um, using a result by Katrin and Salomon from 2012, and um, and the, the trivial co-kernel typically comes out of like dualization arguments and and, and self-adjointness. <clears throat> so um, so that's the end of my talk, um, and um, I will return to the other screen. So, um, 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 so <clears throat> I think the, I'll skip the conclusion because I, I, I kind of um, concluded in, at the end of the first half with the <laughs> narrative and the intro. Um, all the papers that might be of interest are um, listed here. <clears throat> Okay, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Francois. It was great. So, um, so let's uh, yeah, uh, let's open the floor for this for questions. So, anyone that has questions, please unmute yourself. Uh, okay, so I have a question. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so this operator uh, L, the curly L. Yeah. Uh, can you go to a slide with that operator? You had it on several slides. Yeah, um, it's uh, right, right yeah. Up the, up the yeah. Okay. So, how important is the presence of the second term there? That's just the first question. I have another one. It makes it. It makes it self adjoint actually. Yeah. Okay. But if you just think about what is uh, the what are the leading terms, it looks like the second term is not essential, right? Right, so um, I agree with that. Um, uh, for, for the purpose of making it self adjoint, self adjoint I, I, I think uh, it's pretty uh, crucial. If you think about uh, uh, one minus rho, the distance to the boundary, and yeah. just making all those people do it uh, singular manifolds. Uh, so this looks like x dx squared, right? Uh, uh, XGX X, X, X squared, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like the B calculus of Lawson, but not quite. Uh, just trying to put that in one of those classes. Right. Um, so, so um, Rafe has a way to put it in, into of fitting it into uh, 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 the zero calculus. Um, you gotta multiply by by x and then do like a square root type change of variable. But then also also uh, Andras could might have some some things to say about that operator as well. Yeah, probably Andras is the best person to. <laughs> <laughs> I I was actually just going to ask uh, Francois that uh, what's the so so I mean some of your results were in this more general uh, setting, so not restricted to the disk, um, and. Uh, uh, so, so these spaces are basically the zero spaces, right? These uh, the Sobolev spaces. Uh, 
the HDL does. Well, so, so I, mean, I still have to make the to to make the connection. If you if is that a statement or that's a question? Well, it's a question. I mean, I didn't think about uh, it carefully enough. So yeah, yeah. Well, that, that'd be, I mean, it'd be great for me to 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 tie that with the with the zero uh, calculus viewpoint. Yeah, um, I still have to figure that out. I do have one question. Um, the so you were using uh, you adding a, a Gaussian noise to components of the matrix, mm -hmm. uh, but if you if you think about the measurements at, that are naturally valued in a group, then adding nor Gaussian noise to each entry of matrix will and keep you out of the group, mm -hmm. and then maybe you want to project back into the group instead, I don't know, is that a, because that reduced the dimension of your error and maybe, uh, I don't know, what, do you have other reasons why? Yeah, I think um, that's a good suggestion. I just don't know what the, what's an obvious projection and whether it, it makes the analysis uh, more difficult at the statistical level. I see. Yeah, because it seems that even after doing that, you have a sort of, a measure, but on a level of Lie algebra instead of, uh, so which has lower dimension than n squared, which is dimension of the noise that you're adding. That's true. Um, if you look at the experiment, you know, where they, do, where they record component after component, and then there's a bit more, you know, cuisine, um, if you start reading the paper, um, you'll find out that there's no reason why your actual measurements living in the, living in the, live the, live in the, um, expectedly group, yeah. Yes, yes. Um, okay, thank you. Any further questions for Francois? So I was wondering, so you said something about um, for the prior distribution, you have to have some some sort of uh, uh, um, conditions on it. You used in your example, Amatan covariance. So can you say something about, uh, do you have to have a, a Gaussian field as a prior or what What are the assumptions or conditions on the, on the prior? Yeah, so um, some of those conditions still kind of escape me a little bit, but, um, but um, it's a Gaussian prior defined through a, a covariance kernel. That's actually one of the yeah. That was actually one of the motivating ideas of of this project. Also, is that um, a lot a lot of the times people you know use inverse problems where they know the SVD and then they, they have this like Karl Hunan love uh, expansion, right? So you, you take like a SVD yeah. expansion and then add some Gaussian stuff to it. Um, but but here the point is to precisely use um, use a, a, a Gaussian process defined through covariance kernels. And um, and um, there are some there are some conditions on them, but I, I to be honest I don't have the I don't fully understand the, the uh, some of the esoteric aspects of it. Um, I know that they have to charge the space um, at a certain you know they have to charge every ball kind of um, without loss faster than exponential and things of that nature. Um, um, these can be found in the papers. You'll find you'll find a good list of conditions there that that'll tell you uh, <laughs> how to um, how to design your prior. Although um, all the, all the all the priors with you know reproducing reproducing kernel Hilbert space um, to be you know typical HS function for H large enough will work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in, the, in your particular example, you have this this matern covariance functions with a, with a parameter in U that uh, it corresponds. Uh, was it important for you to, what kind of uh, parameter it shows for the for the smoothness there in in yeah. a numerical example? Well, so certainly, um, 
I guess I guess if you if you're using a, a prior that's um, that's not whose typical trajectory is not capturing the the truth very well, I, I imagine the you know the the, the the convergence will slow down or or not converge to the the actual thing at all or or to something that looks like the actual thing at all. Yeah. Um, some of these computations are kind of expensive, so so I you know I, I didn't spend. Um, too much time exploring all the other ways that the parameter, <laughs> the parameter combinations. Um, I just found something that 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 seemed uh, yeah, to, to to work. Yeah. And the thing with these things is you can you can easily uh, spend a lot of times a lot of time engineering. You know, I mean, finding the right values for the parameters and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any, um, any last questions for for Francois? Well, uh, if there are no further remarks or or uh, questions. Let's uh, let's thank uh, uh, Francois again for for a, a very nice talk, and then uh, um, we'll we'll see you again next week. Thank Thanks. you, everyone. Mm -hmm.